Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so um, I didn't return back to the assignment two evaluations. I wanted to go over a few things on that first. I uh, had a couple of, uh, of um, some uh, points that might be helpful, I think, to some people. So in general, most people were fine, uh, did, did well, in fact, uh, at least as long as uh, they were, you know, listening in class and we're doing the right assignment stuff. Um, looking ahead, I, th I think I made some noises about changing the due date for the assignment three, uh, but, um, but, but yeah, I think we're going to have to keep it next week. So, so we're going to have, still have assignment three coming up 
uh, just a little over a week to do on Friday. Um, I I am making some updates to it. It'll be similar to the one that's out there, but it will be slightly modified again. So uh, you can begin looking at it, uh, but uh, wait till hopefully like today or tomorrow uh, before you start on it in earnest. Uh, I'll post an announcement about when it's ready, completely ready to start uh, working on it. Um, just looking at the schedule, we really want to get it done so that, that we have a clear week after next week for the uh, for the first test in the class. So I don't really want those bumping into each other. Um, but but yeah, as as we've already mentioned, I mean it is over kind of the stuff that we were talking about on Tuesday. Uh, we'll continue on today. So um, it's on uh, doing uh, regression on using polynomials uh, functions and and then also some regularization and learning curves and things. Uh, okay, so there's an example solution for the assignment to, uh, let's, um, let me just mention a few things about this. Um, um, so even if you did well, I think that there's some discussion in here that uh, might be useful for everybody to, so I encourage you to, you know, uh, pull this down, take a look at it um, if you get a chance. So um, so one thing I wanted to mention, I mean, this is, you weren't asked to, to perform correlations or anything. So mostly for me, when I was trying to create the assignment, you know, I was looking um, for the on this data set for some things that would give interesting results, or at least that would make sense on different things, you know. So, um, um, calculating the correlations on the numeric attributes or the attributes that are categorical after you convert them um, is useful for understanding this data set uh, if, if you didn't uh, try that out. So for example, for the uh, regression, um, you're asked to do temperature um, to try to predict evaporation uh, for this data set here, uh, temperature at 9 a.m. Um, so, for example, you know, we, we can look through here the, the temperature at 9 a.m. versus evaporation. Um, if you find the correlation, I, I picked that because it had one of the higher ones that wasn't a, a more trivial or obvious. So uh, notice it is a positive correlation, right? So, you know, uh, that should make sense if, if you understand what correlation does, what we're doing here. Since it's positively co correlated, that means that when the temperature goes up, the evaporation should be going up as well. And, and, you know, this is one of the higher correlations that we have. Or in other words, if we plot those versus each other, we should see we would have like positive slope. Um, they're both kind of uh, lower on the left end. And, and as temperature gets bigger, uh, evaporation gets bigger in general. Right? Um, so that's the kind of thing you expect to see for a positive correlation. Um, there are some higher ones, but uh, some most of the higher ones are kind of trivial. So, for example, uh, you see that there's a 99% uh, 0.99 correlation on max temp and the temperature at 3 p.m. Right? That should make sense because usually that's that's the time of day when you're going to have the highest temperature anyway. So they're measuring about the same thing there. In fact, you get that. Uh, likewise, you get a uh, almost. Um, uh, the the pressure uh, at in the morning and at three p.m. Um, um, doesn't change too much usually apparently at least uh, uh, in this location where we were getting weather data from so that's another one but you know those probably wouldn't be too interesting to create linear regressions out of those although you know you might want to try plotting those to see what even a more highly correlated result looks like you know I you, I, I expect if you plot these it's going to be pretty much like a line close to a line, um, like uh, if you take max temp versus the temp at uh, 3 p.m. Um, on the other end, you know, um, the highest kind of negative correlations is um, uh, like about negative 0.76, negative 0.7, a little bit below it, right? So um, humidity and sunshine. Uh, so we'll be using, we use sunshine for the second one, although we didn't, didn't use humidity 
uh, when we did our classification task. Right? Um, but here, you know, um, if you look at these, think about these, uh, most of the time they should make some sense to you. So for example, you would expect high humidity. I, I, I know I'm not really a weather person or anything, but the higher humidity probably means it's cloudier, more likely to rain, uh, which probably has a negative correlation with sunshine, usually most of the time. So, which is why you get one of the bigger negative correlations on that as an um, anyway, uh, well, we'll come back to the risk MM. Um, so, um, so I, I guess, you know, for most people who are doing stuff that I keep repeating in terms of visualizing stuff, which, which is good. I'm glad to see that. You know, so uh, almost everybody had a good figure um, here and also had a good uh, final figure um, to plot the raw data points and also to visualize the fitted regression uh, that you should come up with um, on this data set here. So, um, I mean, in, in this case, you know, almost everybody had the right one. I mean, you know, this one was simple enough that, um, um, people should have been getting the exact same coordinates unless you did something a little bit strange or different. You should have been getting the exact same um, uh, intercept and slope coefficient, right? So that's what I came up with. And if you didn't have that, that was a, something for me to check a little bit deeper in your notebook. Uh, but, but yeah, if you look at the example solution, um, if, if that was different, something happened. You, you, using data, the wrong feature or, or doing some kind of a modification or another. So, um, um, I, I was, I, I did discuss the, uh, the R squared score before. Um, I'm going to just mention that again as well. There's a little bit of some extra um, discussion on the R squared score in this example um, solution here that I posted. So, you know, uh, I did mention this before, so it's, it's it's not mysterious. It's really, but it is used a lot by um, statisticians. So anytime a statistician does a linear regression, you know, the first thing I'll ask is what's the R squared? Uh, because most of them interpret that as, as how good the fit is or how much of the, um, the residuals or the error is explained by the line that's fit uh, by, by the linear regression, right? So it's it's really just the ratio of, you know, if you look at this again, I, I think I did talk about this before, uh, but, you know, really to calculate the R squared, uh, you do it like this, this is one definition of it. Um, the top here, this is really the sum of the different, of the squared differences, right? So this is, when we define the root mean squared error, we're doing the same thing here on the top. We, we take y is the true label, y hat is the hypothesis. So the difference between those is the uh, error, uh, also called the residuals by statisticians. Uh, and then we square that to get the, uh, the, the, the squared error. Um, and we sum those up. Um, those are the sum of squared errors. And uh, we, the, the, we don't take the average, so we're not taking the, the mean. But this is the sum of squared errors, also called the, the residual, sum squared residuals, or the residuals of the sum of the squares. Um, and the bottom, you know, um, this is notational here and might be a little bit hard to see, maybe it's not quite big enough, but the, you know, y hat is usually, is often used by convention, uh, by mathematicians or statisticians that do a lot of mathematical work to mean the hy hypothesis, right? So this was a fit of, of a regression um, that we had here right? that we're, we're using the calculate R squared on. Uh, whereas uh, Y bar uh, just means the mean or the average value. So, so where this is the, the difference of the, uh, the value from the prediction from the true label, this is the difference of the, um, the mean so, so the, the true values in the mean of all the values, right? And, you know, it's a little bit beyond the scope of, of why this works, but the, the, the sum of these can never be bigger than that. They, they can be equal. So in that case, you'll get a one. 
Uh, and if they're equal, that, that's um, um, uh, you take one minus that, uh, you get zero there, right? Um, and uh, that's bad. So that, that means that your, uh, your residuals here, the sum of them is uh, explaining nothing. Right. So when so R squared can uh, range from zero to one, right? Uh, if 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 all these are zero here, so you only get it zero if every time your your prediction is exactly the same as the true value, right? So at the best case, the top can be a sum of everything that's zero. So you get one minus that, you get an R squared of one. Uh, that case, right? So. Um, and again, you know, I, I don't know, we, we probably won't use it too much, although if you ever take a course on statistics or on linear regression or things like that, um, uh, you can learn more about this, but, you know, it's a, it's a common measure. Um, and, and most people, when you look at, like in stats model, when you look at a summary of this, uh, one of the first things the statistician would do is look at that and say, you know, so this is explaining approximately half of the error of the variance in this data for this line, this figure. Right. Um, so anyway, I mean, you know, if you're curious, if you can't, you can calculate it by hand um, or use the, um, you know, so if you calculate it by hand, you should get exactly the same thing as what you would get from using the score um, or the R, squared score function, uh, both from scikit-learn in this case. So there's, there are lots of different ways to get the R squared score. Um, so, so there's a member function for fitted regression models that will report it for you, but they're all getting the same thing. Or you can kind of calculate it for a set of predictions and true labels, right? Uh, it's common error, people that use this function to switch those around, you won't get the right score if you do that. Although I, I don't think anybody did that because because everybody everybody pretty much they have the right R squared score if you have the if you had the right model and had the intercept and the slope I was expecting here. So, but um, but um, yeah. So so the order matters there. So if you put the predictions in. It's the first parameter of the labels. The true labels the second one. You won't. You're not actually calculating the R score R square. You're calculating something else in that case. Um, so, or, right, or, or, you know, this is just meant to demonstrate that, uh, you know, it's nothing mysterious. It's plugging in some numbers. You can, if you know what's being done, you can calculate those yourself. So, so here, you know, I, I always like to show this kind of stuff, you know, because I'm trying, I hope one thing from taking courses like this is that people can, you know, become um, comfortable with formalism, mathematical formalism, right? So it's not mysterious. And, and like I said, I'm not really a mathematician, but uh, whenever I, I translate stuff like this to code, it usually helps me to overcome kind of the, the fear or be able to interpret stuff like it, right? So, I mean, this stuff translates to uh, using uh, NumPy vectorized operations pretty directly, right? So we take the difference, the RSS on the top here, it's just the difference with the labels minus the predictions squared, sum those up. The bottom one, we're doing almost the same thing, but instead of doing the difference, you know, the residuals, we're just doing the difference of the y's and the average over all of those y's. So that, that gives us that uh, TSS. Right? Um, but, but that's all that's being done on the R squared score. Um, all right, and you know, let me know if, if anybody wants to ask a question about things, um, you know, or had a comment about stuff. Um, another little pet peeve, maybe I'll mention. Um, you know, so so people saw the figure, uh, and and I was glad to see people, you know, labeling all the axes and things. Um, um, although a lot of people missed that, uh, you know, we're putting M two so of M squared there. Let me just mention, you know, that, uh, you know, for one thing, you can use uh, LaTeX um, uh, math markup inside a label. So if you put anything between dollar sign, I, I think I've mentioned this before, um, if you put anything in between dollar signs, you do have to use one of these, um, uh, I can't remember, the, but one of these strings with the R in front, whenever you want to use LaTeX markup for a label in a matplotlib figure. But if you put that in, 
Um, you can use, yeah, you know, I encourage you to learn at least some of the basics of LaTeX markup. It's, it's useful. Um, and, and you can use it directly on Jupyter notebooks um, and also in figures that you plot there. Um, the reason, but yeah, it's it's a little detail, but if I, when I see students give me plots um, like this uh, and, and um, you know, you don't specify the units correctly, you know, I know that they're missing stuff. They, 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 there's some details that you're not quite seeing, right? So in this case, you know, it doesn't, M2 doesn't make sense. You know, it, it's it's some measurement of some amount over an area, right? So squared meters is is uh, what what's measured here. So, um, anyway, I'm not just a minor thing, but, uh, um, you know, um, and it's better to, to use that than to use, I mean, the 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 carrot is used often as uh, if you have plain text indicate raise it something to a power, but, you know, if you can do LaTeX markup, you really should use it and use the real notation instead of um, approximations, you know, like like a carrot or something. So the result, you know, right, is, is you'll get a true uh, mathematical notation of something squared, of meters squared in this case. Um, another thing I didn't ask you to do this, but you know, um, you could have actually uh, more easily done the plot there. Oops, that one, um, uh, like um, uh, if you use the Seaborn library, the um, um, this is one of the things one really required uh, in the first weeks. Uh, but there was a notebook on some examples of using Seaborn, which is a more higher level library to visualize data than Matplotlib. It was built on Matplotlib. So, but one of the things you can do with Seaborn is you can ask it to do a basic linear regression plot just directly for you. So instead of calculating this by hand and, and scatter plotting your data, you can just do one command. So pass in your data frame, say which two things you want to visualize, create the plot, create the you know the linear regression model for me and plot that. Um, and it gives some extra information. So really these, uh, the gray area represents the error bars uh, kind of on the model here. So this is the the, the certainty range of the, the line that was put to the model. These are related to, you know, there's another just kind of uh, aside, but these are related to um, um, the information that you get from the summary from stats model. So um, I think I talked about that before, but you know, if you compare this to what you get from scikit-learn, should have gotten exactly the same coefficients, exactly the same R squared score. I have the stuff that I was checking for part one here. Uh, but this stuff is useful for people that that do actual experimental statistical analysis uh, because this is giving information about the confidence interval. Um, so. Uh, as, as a quick approximation, this has given us a 95% confidence interval. So we're, we're, 95, we're, we're confident to a 95% level that the true value of this constant is somewhere uh, between that uh, and that, right? Where 0.37 should be right in the middle of that. Um, and that's not a really, not a really good interval. So the, the, what's known as the p-value is kind of high there. So usually when that's above 0.05, people don't, don't consider it significant. Um, um, but our other parameter also has a confidence interval, but it has a, a much lower p-value. So we're much more confident about the uh, slope uh, here on the line. So, um, and anyway, I mean, this information here is related to kind of these error bars. Um, so you can, you can kind of plot these from a confidence interval like that um, or similar things. Um, and there's lots of other stuff, but but those are some of the things that um, would be useful, I think, for taking from taking a class like this to, to know about fitting a linear regression model, um, which is a basic machine machine learning model. If if we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna do a regression problem, usually you want to start by just doing a simple linear regression um, as kind of a baseline, and then you can do a more complicated machine learning algorithm. To see if it improves or not um, on the performance that you get with uh, straightforward linear regression um, on your data. Um, 
And uh, I'd thrown in, I mean, you know, uh, maybe one or two people lost a point because um, um, I really wanted you to go off and read the documentation for the stats model, right? So, so you know, I mean, not just display this in the summary, but actually figure out how to access the, um, uh, the fitted parameters from the stats model model. Um, you know, so you do it in a slightly different way. So you, you use the params. Uh, member variable um, accessor to get the slope and the intercept um, and, and likewise the R squared score. So those are both available on a stats model OLS model um, as uh, uh, member variables, basically is the way I think of them. Um, although I also did see some people, I, I think if you if you use a data frame to fit the regression, you can actually um, ask for by name um, like if I want to pull out the constant term. So I saw some people doing that. Um, um, or actually not here, but but for the logistic regression, um, which is something I actually, you know, so I learned stuff too, looking at people figuring stuff out. So didn't know you could do that. And, um, I guess that's my supports, be able to pull out these by name. Although I think you might have to, you know, use a data frame uh, for your... Uh, your input values and your labels in order to do that. I'm, I'm not certain. Um, all right, so uh, so um, let's see. So the so moving on for the logistic regression, the binary classification. Uh, I did ask you to do a little bit of. Um, Data cleaning, right? So a few things, um, and and again, you know, I was pretty happy. Most people were fine on on these. Um, some people used a, a label encoder instead of an ordinal encoder. Uh, I didn't really talk about that, uh, and, and actually, in this case, a, a label encoder makes more sense. The, the you can do the same thing with both of them. A label encoder, as the name implies, is meant to be used for if you have like a, a single column or a single thing that you're going to be using as a label of the data to train with, right? So a label encoder expects a vector, you know, just, just one feature item where an ordinal, ordinal encoder does the same thing and it encodes a categorical variable, but uh, you can actually use it to encode multiple features at a time. So ordinal encoders are used more often to encode input features that you're going to be used to train with um, in, in the array where um, if I'm if I have a, a binary label because I'm doing binary categorization, um, I might use just a, a, a the label encoder. So anyway, um, that was that was good. Some people were using label encoders, an ordinal encoder here. Um, um, I don't remember if anybody did this. Yeah, I, I think you do have to be careful to specify that you know you want the nose to be. Um, map to zero in the F system one. So if you don't do that, uh, it might do what you want, but it, it might switch them around. Right? And you can still kind of get the same results, you know, if you had uh, no encoded as one and yes as zero. But, um, you know, but, but that, that would be confusing. Uh, you might end up confusing somebody if, if somebody ends up looking down at your raw data. And, by definition, you know, we always think of zero as the false or the no label uh, if we're doing a binary category and one as the yes or the true label. Uh, but yeah, I don't don't remember. I don't I didn't don't think I caught anybody making that mistake. So I had lot, lots of different ways people were trying to, 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 um, to confirm that we had the right encoding. Um, sometimes I didn't think people did a great job on that, but I don't think I really took points off on that. So, you know, uh, for for using the ordinal encoder, uh, if you ask for the categories, you know that this encoded zero is no and one is yes because the zero value comes first and the one comes second. Or you can just be more explicit. So if you look at your original array before you did the encoding, I had uh, three, four yeses followed by a no, or you guys did two. So I should see ones for the first four values and then zero. You know, so that'd be another way that you just pretty much uh, demonstrate that we did get the encoding as was asked for there. Um, 
and right, most people were using the computer and um, right. I don't know if I, I don't think I had any comments on that one. Um, Uh, oh, um, yeah, I wanted to mention um, kind of showing the correlation again, but adding in. So so here for the binary classification, uh, we were uh, trying to predict the rain tomorrow. So um, so it's this was again, this wasn't asked for, but it is useful, interesting to look at the correlation between what you're going to be trying to predict and all the features you have in the data set if you didn't do that, right? So to do that though, you know, uh, rain tomorrow is actually a string. So you do have to first encode it. Um, so in this example, a notebook, you know, we, we after the encoding, we add, it, we add the encoded value back into um, an array of the numeric value so that we can do the correlation here. If you're, if you're curious, if you didn't run correlations yourself, so. The rain tomorrow, we, um, I asked you to use, what was it, the, the sunshine and the pressure. Uh, I'll mention something about that in a second here, but but um, um, I, and basically I picked those uh, because they're relatively highly negatively correlated. So, you know, uh, the sunshine was negative 0.39 if you look at the correlation um, and the pressure at, uh, what was it, uh, 3 p.m. Um, where is it? There it is. It was also around a negative 0.3 or something. So if you look at all those, um, there was a, a, a positive correlation. I could have maybe picked that. Um, um, so we had an equivalent uh, for cloud is at 3 p.m., but positively correlated. Most of the rest of them were a little bit less than that. And, um, oh, humidity also, you can uh, maybe use that. So. Uh, oh, except uh, also, you know, risk in if you look at that. Uh, I'm not certain. Like I said, I kind of got this data set at random. So risk mm uh, is named differently than the other. So it doesn't follow the same convention. I suspect that it might be cheating to use this. So this might have uh, been some sort of a measurement after the, the fact or something. So, but it, it actually does have the highest correlation. But as some people did, um, uh, it... it um, um, it doesn't make as good of a, an example if, if you uh, try using like risk PM and something else, uh, risk MM. Um, so um, I did take off a point uh, because some people, I, I know that there, there was a, uh, a mistake in the comment, but we did discuss this in class on Tuesday. Uh, you know, and, and I expected that, that people should have either asked me or should have realized from the context since, since the whole thing was about uh, creating a uh, a classification between these two parameters, you know, we really want to start by visualizing the two parameters we're going to create uh, a model of, right? So it didn't make sense uh, to to use risk mm, but then to switch over to using um, sunshine and pressure after that. So if you did the sunshine pressure, you know. Should have gotten exactly that, and, and again, I don't think anybody had the stuff reversed or anything, or had the labels wrong, right? So since the since these were both the the two things I selected were both negatively correlated, what you see is that both at this corner where they're both the smallest, uh, though to, to this negative correlation, uh, that's where you're most likely to get the yeses for the label, the one labels, and and, and since they're both negatively correlated, when they're both high, that's where you're more likely to get the nos. So, so, so we get the nose more up in the upper right and the S is down here. Um, so um, in this case, um, so we had some questions about this. Um, I did ask you to use a particular solver. Most people did use what, what was asked for. Uh, I finally figured out some some people this wasn't converging even if for, for some people even if they were using the um, um, the parameters that I gave there I think all those people um, were doing a train test split which wasn't asked for I don't think I took anything off for that I, I, I did want people to to just train it on all the data but but uh, but yeah I mean if if you split it and you and you only train on eighty percent of the data. Uh, that tolerance doesn't converge, I think. I think that was the main reason why some people uh, got a non-convergence on here. 
uh, where it, it, it usually converges for me. Uh, and again, you know, I, I, um, um, if you used a different solver, you wouldn't get a picture that you can easily interpret the decision boundary on. And uh, all I'll say about that is uh, because the other solvers, I believe, uh, they tend to um, um, uh, scale the data for you behind the scenes. So the results that you get reported back for the parameters are on the scaled data. So you either have to unscale the parameters or plot the, the, the data in the scaling that it does in order to get the decision boundary that makes sense, right? Um, but the, the Newton solver um, um, doesn't do that. And that seems to be the one that's the most similar to the default one with the SAS model. And Logit does it as well. Um, so if you did it the way I asked for here, you should have gotten basically, and if you did it on all of the 366 points, all on the 100% of the data, if you fit your logistic regression model, you should have gotten exactly these parameters. Um, and I, I don't think we need to discuss again. So uh, um, uh, next week, we will talk a little bit more again about decision boundaries, but this, this is our first example. Uh, but a similar thing is happening here as happens for the linear regression, right? So we're getting parameters that correspond to the slope for the two features that we use now. Um, and basically what it comes down to is the place where the, 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 the two slopes and the intercept, the place where that's zero, that uh, for a binary classification, that uh, defines the dividing. So everything on one side, uh, the predictions are gonna be uh, yes or true, it will rain and everything on the other side, that line defined by that decision boundary will be have false prediction. Right? Um, so that that line will be where it's zero. And so uh, so if you plug in any value, I, I think I am repeating some things that I talked about before. But yeah, if you plug in any value that's up up into the right um, into this equation. Uh, with the particular theta zero, theta one, and uh, intercept that you get. Again, that, that's the, so that's the intercept you should have gotten, um, and you should have gotten negative values for the two slopes because, well, um, so that's what you got. So, so anything over here, if you plug in, you're going to get a value that's bigger than zero, positive value. If you plug it in anywhere over here, um, uh, you'll get a value that's less than zero. Um, and zero is going to be used as a threshold to make the decision whether I'm going to predict yes or no um, for this logistic regression here. Again, yeah, we'll talk more about that uh, next week if you haven't got started yet on the logistic regression um, materials. So, um, but like I said, I, most... I guess we discussed it adequately enough because again, most people, if you were getting the right parameters or even if you were doing, like I was talking about, if you're only using 80% of the data to train with, you still got pretty much about the same decision boundary. So um, the, the figure would look pretty much about right, almost exactly right. Um, all right, what else? And you know, uh, again, I, I was looking for um, you to. Uh, I was basically checking that you were getting uh, the same results that I got. You do. I, I didn't. I didn't grade. I, uh, some people did give me a little discussion. I didn't really grade. Um, um, uh, what you said about this, uh, the the parameters aren't exactly the same. Um, I believe that the, the I, I need to go and read the documentation a little bit. I believe stats model is using the same solver, but I think that uh, if you play around and and uh, with that convergence parameter, so by by changing, let me go back here. Or where did I create the model? Uh, here, uh, by changing that parameter, uh, we uh, allow it to go long enough to converge but we uh, might need it to go a little bit further to end up with exactly the same parameters the SAS model gives. 
So even though they're using probably pretty much like the same solver, it might do a few more iterations with them here. So you end up with slightly different values uh, if you examine them closely. Similar, but slightly. So, so, you know, we got 185 and, and negative here. Um, and if you did it with all the data for the staff model, you get like 186 um, and negative 3.2 or 7, negative 3.1, 0.31. Um, for the easier. Um, Um, oh, yeah, and one final thing, so I also on purpose didn't do this, so you probably need to Google this or do um, a little research. Um, it's a little bit surprising. I, I, I would think that there is a method in stats model that would, that would give you the, the prediction after threshold is it. Right? So the basic predict method uh, I, I didn't. I didn't do a lot of searching whether that's true or not. So the basic predict method, if you look at it, the task model gives you a result between zero and one, and you'll understand that more when we talk about logistic regression next week. So uh, let me see if I can. So if you look at like the first five values, you'll see that if they're numbers, um, if you look at all, and you should find that they're all between zero and one. So to, to get a final prediction, you actually have to threshold this result. And as far as I, as I can tell, a fast model doesn't have another method that will perform the threshold for you. Some people, I, I, again, I, probably, I think I took a point off for this. But for some people, for some reason, some people were thresholding this, but we're using uh, a value like 0.9 or 0.8. And, and feel free to, to send me, you know, if you're Googling that from somewhere, we talked about that. But, but the default usually is just to use 0.5. Right, so you, you can change that threshold, uh, and that will actually change the uh, by the um, um, uh, the, uh, the the trade off that you get um, for your false positives and your false negatives that, that we talked a little bit about um, previously. Right, but but you know usually 0.5 is just used. Right, so you know, there are lots of ways you could do that. So in this example using round, round, will, anything above 0.5 will, will get rounded to one, anything below 0.5 will get rounded to zero. So uh, we use a little little bit of Python code in this example to round all the values um, uh, to get our final threshold and predictions. if we examine uh, these here. So um, uh, hmm, did I do something wrong there? One one I was expecting. No. I'll have to go back and look at that. I'll probably probably I've got the I've got I've probably got some different predictions here because I've probably got Got them changed from when I did it down here. So that's well, that's the things. Um, one of the method it flips the the entire making noise. Right. Um, could be right. Um, I think because um, I re I ran the whole notebook and I'm going back and rerunning previous stuff. I probably got some different predictions now from when I ran it down here um, and, and a little extra thing. So one of those, but but. Uh, I think I'm right. I just don't. I need to rerun it, but you, you should expect it. You go back and examine that. But uh, yeah, the API for stats model works the order of inputs and labels get Yeah, maybe. So, um, yeah, nobody. I didn't catch anybody doing that. But but yeah, you know, when you create your model, you do have to make certain that you. Put those in in the right order where you get strange results. Um, so, um, let me just 
test it real quick or it's going to bug me here. So um, I just make certain that I got the predictions I have here. What we actually get is, um, yeah, so that's more what I'm expecting. So anything below 0.5 should get threshold down to zero. That's the first two and the last two. And anything above 0.5 should get threshold up to one. Um, all right, and uh, that's it. If if um, you know um, you can even with remember logistic regression is a linear model, so it's creating a decision boundary that's a line or a plane. Um, so so it's really a linear decision thing. Um, so. Um, and again, we're, we're getting into some of the stuff we're going to discuss next week as well when we get into logistic regression. But, you know, one, one purpose of this visualization is to show, you know, you're not going to be able to, with a linear model, you're not going to be able to get a real good accuracy. So the accuracy was 0.86 uh, when you fit this, 86% correct. Lot, lots of things are on the wrong side, uh, you know, uh, even with the best uh decision boundary what your logistic regression comes up with right but uh even though you can't get very high accuracy with these two features uh you could still get uh, good performance even with a you know a linear model like logistic regression uh if i have three features or higher dimensions more more features so, so there might be decision boundaries in three or four or five dimensions that separate this even better um, and um, the I already I already showed the risk mm actually has the highest correlation to uh, the rain tomorrow that we we're trying to predict. So what I was asking for on this last one, you know, so people did some other interesting stuff. You know, so we could also add in some of the other higher correlated features. See how good we get a basic logistic regression here. Uh, but if you just add in risk mm to the two that you were supposed to do for all the other things up there. Uh, it immediately jumps to 99% accuracy um, on the data that you've trained for. And a lot of people got that same result. You know, they get that more. Although, again, you know, if I was doing this for real data, I probably would be a bit suspicious of that now. I mean, are we overfitting? Right? So it would be better to do a train test split or like a, a, a cross-validation. But that, that, that result does seem relatively robust. So if you do like a a threefold cross validation, you still get 98, 99% most of the time. All right. Um, so that was all I wanted to mention. Anybody have other kind of comments about the second assignment? So like I said, there's some extra stuff in there. Um, I think it'll be useful, but those are some of the things I was thinking about when when making the assignment and uh, kind, of, kind of the stuff that I hope that you um, um, are thinking about as well and realize about what we're doing here. Um, okay, if nothing else, let's go ahead and continue on. Um, um, so my main goal then is to kind of go through regularization, uh, see if we can talk about that, clear up anything people, any questions people might have about what regularization is. Uh, let, let me uh, just uh, mention a couple of things, uh, review a couple of things from last time. So we did talk about the polynomial regression and the learning curves. Um, um, real quickly, I, I just wanted to emphasize, summarize uh, the learning curve dis discussion uh, because I think that a lot of people, you know, um, uh, some of the points made here uh, are, goes over uh, some people's heads when we talk about these learning curves here. The basic one is, so for this first one here, uh, we are doing the learning curves, however we generate them on a model that is underfitting the data. So we're using a, uh, a a line to try and fit data that's inherently not linear. It's actually a, a, a power of two function, if you remember back to when we did this year. So um, when you're underfitting, uh, normally, you will get them to converge if you compare performance on the data you train with versus performance on unseen validation of test data. So that's the, that's the basic thing of what is done with a um, learning curves like this is, is we, we plot our fitness 
function, so our measure of how well it's doing in terms of the fitness function, uh, but we, we plot it simultaneously on the, the data that we're training it with uh, and data that we didn't train it. If they converge, uh, either it's underfitting or um, um, it might be a good model. Right? So the main thing about this is um, um, this, this may be converging. That's another point I should make. So, so the example we give here is relatively clear in that, you know, it's kind of obvious that uh, you could maybe argue about whether that's taking longer to converge or not. But, but obviously here, there's a pretty big gap before uh, these come to similar performance on the second learning curve. And then here, this is more clearly, even more clearly than the first one, uh, relatively quickly in similar performance, the converging here. Right? So uh, in in if you do this with real data, it's not always going to be, you know, and you can look at something like this and that might be not converging very well in some context versus others that might be pretty good convergence. Take some experience to make decisions like that. But in this case, uh, this is converging relatively, but uh, the thing about an underfit model is, you know, what you want to look at is is the performance that you got for the uh, for both of these, but but especially for the training data. Right? So we only ended up our cost function of somewhere above 0 0.15, 0 0.17, or 0 0.18 when they converged here. So if you don't know if it's underfitting or not, a good thing to do is you know you first start with a model. So this is what we'll be doing. Uh, for your assignment, uh, uh, your assignment three, some of some of the things you'll be doing. So you first want to start with a model that you assume is going to underfit, so you can get information um, like we had here, right? Um, and you'll kind of know it's underfitting, or it's either fitting well or underfitting because they the two lines converge. But if it's a model that you think is underpowered or underfitting, um, um, you want to compare that to a a model that you think is overfit. Uh, um, our second learning curve here, where we're using like a degree 100 polynomial, try to fit this degree two function that we're trying to model here. So yeah, it was degree 100. Um, so here, because of the gap, we should um, assume that uh, this is overfitting. And, and uh, you know, you should understand why this happens for overfitting. Um, uh, so obviously we're gonna do well if we measure um, our cost on the data that we trained with, but an overfit model uh, is just gonna fall apart when you measure how well it does on data it hasn't seen before, right? Uh, which is what's happening because, you know, which is what's causing the gap here. And so this data does fine on stuff that it's trained with, but it does really badly and, and you know, this is an important point. So hopefully people understand. It's like, like if you look at this figure, this is meant to give you an intuition of why that's true, right? So for uh, the green, which is highly overfit here, of course, we're gonna do well on the, the points we fit with. That, that was the whole purpose of, of fitting this high degree model. It's trying to get near to all the points you gave it. But as soon as you give it a point you didn't give it, you know, so here we should be predicting somewhere around here but it's actually going to predict really badly for lots of, uh, of points here that you give it uh, if it wasn't trained with those. So your right, so your your evaluation will fall apart when you're overfitting, um, and you'll get big gaps like this that may or may never uh, converge back together. Um, so then, right. To, to figure out whether you're getting the model that's actually well fit or not, uh, you need to have a feeling for whether, you know, uh, whether I've got an example of something that's underfitting, uh, but but still relatively converging. Um, but if it's underfitting, um, we should be able to build models that do better, uh, that are uh, more correctly powered. Right? So in that case, uh, you'll get convergence, and you'll also, though, get uh, a lower overall cost once you convert. So instead of point, above 0.15, uh, we get something more around 0.1 uh, for the, you know, the good model right here. So 
uh, again, we know that this is a good model because we know we're trying to fit a degree two polynomial and we're using a degree two model here uh, in our fitting. So that's really the best model we can do with this data. Um, all right, questions about that? So that was kind of where we left off last time. This is, these are all important concepts, right? And you'll be doing this on the third assignment. Um, same kinds of thing, creating learning curves uh, and trying to interpret them. Um, all right, so... Uh, let's then look at, uh, so we'll also be doing a little bit of stuff with regularization on assignment three. Um, I don't really want to rerun this. Hopefully everything is good because uh, there are some things that will take a little bit of time to calculate on this one. So, um, So in practice, unlike on the previous notebook, uh, we're never really going to know um, what 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 reality is. We're, we're never really going to know kind of what uh, how powerful the model we would need, or, or what is controlling the data. Um, uh, is, is, is what function uh, is actually generating the data, right? Um, So, but yeah, in, in practice, uh, we, we wouldn't regularize, or we, well, we wouldn't uh, do different models by doing polynomial regression like we were doing that. So <laughs> in the previous notebook, uh, we know that we had a function that was a degree two polynomial, um, and we were comparing using more powerful or less powerful models um, to see how that, the thing fit. But, but normally things don't work that way. Um, so, we can get the same effect by uh, doing what's known as regularizing the model. So this applies a penalty um, um, uh, or, or you know, known as a regularization term in order to penalize models that are um, uh, being too powerful or being too specific, okay? Um, so, um, so for, for regression, um, uh, we can we can regularize. Uh, so, so our textbook talks about what uh, three basic ones. Well, actually two basic ones: ridge and lasso. And elastic net is really kind of a combination of the two. And I think I asked you to use all two, three of these, or at least two of these, for the assignment three. Um, so. So bridge regression um, um, is the easiest probably to understand. Actually, there's uh, both ridge and lasso are, are, are very similar here, as you'll see in a second, if you haven't looked over this material yet. So um, let, just define this, okay? So this is uh, called the regularization term or the regularization penalty. So again, we got some notation here. Um, all we're saying is, remember, this is supposed to represent all the theta parameters, right? So um, on the uh, the one we were doing in the previous notebook, um, since we had a function that was um, a, a squared polynomial, we actually had three terms. We had um, um, uh, the 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 constant term, we had the x to the power of one term, and the x squared term. So we had three thetas um, uh, in the example we were doing previously. Right. So here, this notation is just saying whatever values you have for theta, uh, just uh, square those and sum them. So realize what that does, right? So if all your thetas are close to zero, if you square something with zero and sum it up, you get a result that's zero. But if your thetas are really big, uh, really big positive or really big negative, so we're squaring for the kind of same reason that we did for the the root mean squared error. We re really want the magnitude. We want how far away it is from being like a small or zero parameter here. Um, so if, if, if your values are really big, um, um, uh, when you square those and sum them together, you get a this um, penalty will be correspondingly very big, right? 
Um, so what we do with that is, so down here, we're J is, is our cost function, our root mean square error cost function um, that we talked about before. But uh, so, so this is what we talked about before for linear regression, calculating the mean squared error. Um, um, but we add on to that this regularization term, right? So what this does is again, if if um, if all the parameters are close to zero or zero, this goes away, and this just becomes the same cost function that we've already talked about for linear regression. But if all these parameters end up being really big, um, um, this term can become very big and might outweigh uh, the cost that you're getting from, you know, from fitting your model well. Right? So this ends up giving you a trade-off. Um, um, because it's, so they're, they're, these two terms are doing com two competing things, right? For this one, uh, we just want the right values of, of our parameters, theta, that will uh, minimize the residuals, minimize the errors, right? But for this one, we want to try to drive the, the phase to be as small as possible, zero, uh, if we can. So if, if we do that well for both of these, we'll get low costs. And if one or the other or both of them we're not doing well on, we'll get high costs. Uh, when we add in this regularization term, all right? So um, why do we do that? Well, you know, if you look at the examples, um, um, uh, it, it helps to build into intuition of why uh, regularization, what it does and why it's useful, right? So um, uh, here, uh, what are we doing? So we're, we're using kind of, I think the same function as we used before. So our, our true function is just a, a squared uh, quadratic polynomial here. So, you know, the, the best values in terms of the mean squared error would be to have uh, 0.5 for the this uh, uh, theta, uh, 0.75 for, you know, one of the thetas and, and three. So that'd be the, the, the lowest cost that we can get. If we can get the the correct theta, we can find that right. Um, so imagine though, if we don't know what the you know the true true degree of the function is that we're trying to model, uh, we can get a similar. We, we can we can try and find a good model by picking something that's overpowered. So in this example, we're using uh, twenty five degree twenty five model, and we're going to fit it, but we're going to fit it with some regularization. All right. So, uh, oh, so um, I forgot to mention that uh, our skipped over. So one thing, there is one meta parameter for um, regularization. Uh, so it's alpha in this case. So we can set that. If we make alpha zero, uh, again, this whole thing goes away. So for an alpha zero, we're not doing regularization. We're just doing straightforward uh, mean squared error for the cost function. Uh, but if we make alpha really big, that means that even if we have a really good fit of parameters, if they're if, if the parameters are big, uh, we'll give it a lot of penalty, right? And 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 you can try the the goal is to try to balance that. You want to add in a little bit of penalty, but not so much that you can't get the signal from the uh, the, the original cost function to find good parameters for theta that you're, that, that you're trying to fit in. So um, in this example, we um, our first one here since alpha zero, this is just regular linear regression with no regularization. Uh, but then we, we do the same thing um, um, with an alpha of one and so, so kind of a medium alpha and uh, an alpha of 100, so three examples. So the result is something like this. So um, remember, this, this is a degree 25 polynomial. So if we don't do regularization, we get something that's typically overfit. So the blue here uh, is a overfit model and it wiggles. And the reason why it wiggles a lot is because uh, for the, the, the 25 theta parameters, we allow them to be any size they want. So they can become really big, which is, allows it to uh, wiggle this thing around here um, for prediction. Uh, on the other end, uh, if we 
if we completely emphasize regularization, so out, when alpha is 100, you don't quite get a line here, but basically you say, uh, just give me uh, a result that uh, where all the phase parameters are zero, which ends up being about like a line uh, as your model. Not not quite. If we made that even bigger, it would, it would become more and more like a line that goes through the mean values of, of all the values you're trying to fit here with no slope. Um, um, so by 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 and, and alpha would be a meta parameter here. So so um, so instead of trying to you know propose that I'm going to fit different size polynomials, I can use the same model, but I can uh, tune the alpha here to try to find the one that gives me the best fit. Right? So in this case, one gives us a pretty good fit. So the true function, um, our, our, our quadratic function is the, uh, the dash line here. And with an alpha of about 1.0, we get a function that looks about like that, except for maybe on the ends, where you can see it's starting to uh, do some things here. Um, also, another useful thing to look at is um, look at the actual parameters here. So um, here we're looking at, um, um, probably didn't use real good names on these, but the, the one called ridge regression small is the one with the alpha of one on these figures. And then we had ridge regression zero. And uh, definitely it's a, I, I had this figure with some different examples here, so I should probably rename these, but this other one is the one with actually an alpha of 100. So for the small, um, this was the one that is looking the best fit here to the true function that we have. And so notice the values, in fact, look at the first three parameters. So these correspond to the intercept, uh, and this is the x to the power one, x to the power of two. Right? So we still got values for all these others, but, but these are relatively close. Um, so, uh, no, that's not right. So, oh, oh, no, yeah, so that's the intercept. Uh, and that, that's the x to the power of one and x to the power of two, right? So notice, so this, this is three for the intercept of the true function, and this was three fourths and, um, and one half there, just to compare that. And some of these others are still relatively big, although all, all the rest of these are uh, smaller than the biggest one here, right? Because, again, because, uh, an alpha of one is a relatively good balance here. So um, uh, we drive most of the parameters that we don't need, which are gonna be like the degree three, degree four parameters in the panel. We drive those to be small because when they're small, uh, it doesn't really affect uh, our error much. But that, uh, but by having alpha at the right value, the, the values, the, the parameters that do matter um, can get good estimates. Right? which is what's happening here, right? So we get a good estimate for the intercept um, and the x to the power of one and the x to the power of two, the, 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 the linear and the squared term. I mean, not perfect, but relatively close. Whereas if you look at, um, um, this one, um, Um, not looking, looking quite the same as I remember, but um, that, that's supposed to, to correspond to the the one that, um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, that, this one corresponds to where we have a very high value of, of alpha. So we're basically kind of driving all the parameters to be close to zero in this case, right? So uh, in that case, uh, we still end up with the, the intercept at about the right term, because it's going to be somewhere that's close to like the average uh, of the, the y values here. But most of the other values are zero. So we end up with a line, not exactly, but a line that ends up being close to being just horizontal with an intercept of, of three here. Right? So, you know, I don't know if it's, I mean, some are, it's not the greatest example, but most of these are relatively small except for maybe this first one. Uh, they're, they're all less than uh, 0.1 mostly compared to like that and that and that, um, where, where alpha was pretty well done. 
Um, so, so yeah, I should move on. So um, I thought, you know, we also displayed um, Um, if if we had displayed the parameters for the overfit line, you would have seen that uh, a lot of them had really big values, much bigger than what we got for the well-tuned um, regression here. Um, so let me move on then. So last regression, we're pretty much doing the same thing, but instead of taking the square, we take the absolute value, and we talk a little bit about that where we talked about the, the root, root mean squared error. Um, so here you, we get a similar thing, but it has slightly different properties. Um, and the book talks about why, yeah, why it's called lasso versus ridge regression. Um, but you should expect something about the same here, right? So again, if, if theta is really big, the absolute whether it's really big, positive ne or negative, if you take the absolute value, you're going to get a big value there. So you get a big sum for this penalty term. And if they're all close to zero, though, the sum of those would be zero. Right? So, so it has a similar tendency to, to um, this term to try to make those parameters as small as possible versus this term is trying to make them be good predictors for the data you're trying to get. Um, so um, here we're doing the same thing with a degree 25 polynomial, although we have to use uh, different values of alpha um, so this is actually effectively zero. So again, we're not using any uh, lasso regression for the one we called zero here. Uh, for the small, we're using uh, an alpha of 0 0.01. Um, and this one is effectively allowed to overfit, uh, although the alpha is, is one in this case. So here though, uh, no, it's, it's much clearer. So you can see that when we use too much alpha, uh, you get exactly a line, um, a horizontal line. Um, and uh, we probably should have used, and so uh, when you use alpha close to zero, uh, it's, it's better than before, but it's a little bit of overfitting. And the alpha 0 0.01 gives us a relatively good fit. Um, here, that's the orange line. One thing, uh, um, so this will be useful for your assignment because out the the this um, lasso regression, um, it tends to drive parameters to zero uh, more forcefully than the ridge regression. So the result, um, so if we look at uh, the one that was the best, everything is pretty much a zero except for the intercept um, and the uh, the slope for the x to the power one and the x squared, right? And these are relatively close. So three is the correct value there, 0.75 is the correct value there, and 0.5 is the correct value there as well. So if, if you know, like, like for our assignment, you're trying to predict an actual polynomial, so, so lasso can be useful to determine, okay, how many actual, you know, what is the actual power of the function that I'm trying to make a model of? So this, this is a pretty clear indication uh, since I got have alpha two correctly, that it's a square, it's a model to the power of two, because I got x one and x two terms, and everything else got driven to zero. Um, where the one where the the alpha was too high, everything will get driven to zero, even the ones that we really need to make a good model. So you end up with a line that, that that's horizontal going through um, uh, y of three point one six in that case. Um, all right, so yeah, um, uh, elastic net, uh, just to, to finish this up here, uh, is really just a combination of the two. So, so if, if you look at this, again, it's notation, but uh, we're really using both the, uh, the um, uh, absolute value, uh, which happened there, and the squared value, and then we combine those. So in this case, uh, alpha works the same way as it did for uh, lasso and ridge, uh, but we have a second value R, which controls the amount of mixing of the two. So if R is one, you'll just be using this term because 
one minus one will give you zero. But I got away. So when R is one, you're basically just doing um, the, uh, the the lasso regression. We talked about it the second one. Used to be absolute value. And when R is zero, this goes away. You're, you're basically doing the first one using the squares. And if you make it half, then you get somewhat kind of in between on the two there. Um, by the way, um, 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 because I think I use these terms in the, uh, the assignment, um, um, mathematicians, when, when you square this uh, like this, uh, this is known as like the L2 norm. Um, so sometimes uh, the, the, the first one, the ridge regression is, is re referred to as L2 regression. Whereas when you do the absolute value, that's known as the L1 norm. Hopefully I got those in, in the right, I got those right there. So you'll see um, um, lasso referred to by mathematicians in some contexts as an L1 norm. You know, it's really the same thing. Statisticians like to call this ridge and lasso and mathematicians that are doing um, linear algebra and stuff talk about L1 and L2 norms um, uh, for these same kind of concepts here. Um, all right. Uh, and then finally, um, you can also get a regularization effect by doing early stopping. Uh, I'm probably going to have to leave this to talk about this in more detail at a later time. But uh, the, the problem is, is that a model, if you look at the learning curves, will often uh, increase performance, but at some point it'll start overfitting and then performance will decrease. So another way you can just get a good model is just to monitor when performance starts getting worse on your uh, test data. Uh, when it starts doing that, you just stop training, you stop fitting, you stop iterating like you're breaking descent. Um, and that, that's really what early stopping is. All right. Um, yeah, that's all I want to cover today. So um, I will let you guys go. Um, like I said, I'll post an announcement about assignment three, I hope today or early tomorrow. So look for that. And, uh, yeah, that's it. See you guys next week then. One that you calculated R squared by hand in the in the notes, or uh, it's in that example solution that I posted on my video on the Example solution. Yeah, so you know, if you go to our, our class homepage, mm -hmm. there's a link to so this one. Okay, all right. All right. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what's up? Um, well, so yeah, it's going to be uh, next week. We're going to be finishing up logistic regressions. It's the week after that. So, so we'll be doing it that, that week after that. So it is coming up. Yeah. The data that just mentioned is 19. So. Um, yeah. So um, I haven't completely decided. So it'll be either like uh, a one. This is probably going to be online, so I'll probably open it up for like a day or two or something like that. So, uh, yeah, or it might be, um, it might be that I give you a notebook, so it'll be kind of like an assignment, or it might be like a, where you get to go into my Leo on, online and do like a quiz kind of thing. I'm not certain. So, in either case, I'll probably give at least you know two days or so where it's open to do it. So. Um, I'm gonna keep it like next week, so we'll have a a, a week in the day. So next next Friday, and then then yeah, the week after that is when we'll be talking about the exam. Thank you.